thank you for joining us today. We're so glad you tuned in. You can use the number at the bottom of the screen to let us know you're watching for more information and any prayer requests you may have. You can also visit us online at truenorthak.org. Good morning, everybody. Would you stand to your feet? Put those hands together.
Isn't that our prayer? We want to know you more and more. Amen. You know, we pause the first of every month to partake of Holy Communion together. There's two sacraments that we celebrate at True North Church that are sacred. So they're called sacraments. One is water baptism and one is Holy Communion. It's something we hold sacred. It's, it's, it's things we, the church is, uh, there, there, there are times we pause and, and reflect on how God and what he's done in our hearts and life. So, uh, communion here at True North is, is it's free. You don't have to be a member of the church. Um, uh, communion is three things. It's one, it's celebration. It's celebrate, celebrating what Christ did on the cross for us. How I many you know he died? was buried and rose again and because of that we can celebrate that relationship with Jesus number one it's celebration number two it's proclamation as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup you proclaim my death until I come and lastly it's examination the the Bible says not to eat the bread or drink the cup in an unworthy manner and so true north communion is open for every one of us you really set the 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 requirement is that you have a relationship with Jesus. How can you proclaim something you don't believe in? How can you celebrate something you don't embrace? How can you eat the bread in a worthy manner to, 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 to contemplate and examine what the bread and the cup mean if for you it's just something you do? In the Bible, in fact, in Corinthians, says you don't come and you don't, it's not a snack, it's not a meal. It, it's, it's, a, it's a sacred moment where you reflect on the power of Jesus' relationship with Jesus in your life. And so if you're here and you've never, you're watching online, you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, communion is a celebration of that decision you have with Jesus. If you've never made a commitment to Christ or maybe uh, your relationship with Christ is like last week's uh, uh, The Roads last Sunday, and you're maybe you're high-centered and you never got going or, or you're, there's a lot of bumps and you're off the road, it's as simple as coming back to Jesus. And I always say it's as simple as ABC. A, admit you sin. We've all sinned, the Bible says. A, admit. Starts there. God, I admit I've sinned. B, believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And C, confess him as the Lord of your life. If you're here, you're watching online, you've never made a faith commitment to admit, believe, and confess. I'd like to pray with you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes wherever you're at? You've never, but you, today you want to begin or you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. You, you're far from Him, but today you want to have a grand opening and, and partake of communion as a symbol of that, that faith. Just pray this prayer with me silently as I pray it out loud. Dear Jesus, today I acknowledge my sin. I admit that I've lived my life uh, outside the plans you have for me, but today I confess my sins believing the fact that you died on the cross to forgive me. Please forgive me today, Jesus. And Lord, today I confess you as the Lord of my life. I, I choose to make you my life leader and give you the steering wheels of my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, congratulations. Today's the grand opening on the rest of your life. The Bible says when you pray that prayer, the old is gone, the new has come. You're a new creation. Would you give it up for those who prayed it for the very first time? Come on. Our ushers are going to come at this time to serve you. As, as you're served, uh, if, if during the song you take the time to peel back that thin layer to, to expose the bread, they're prepackaged here, and have the bread in one hand and the cup in the other, uh, if you'd wait till everyone's been served, I'll come back and we'll partake together. Let's worship the Lord together. We all stand amazed in awe of amazing grace. The divide has been erased. We thank you. All sin is washed away. You alone have saved the day. We are forever changed and we thank you. Let every song, every tongue come sing of your
cross amen. amen it's what we celebrate the elements you have in your hand the bread represents his body which was broken for us and the cup represents his blood which is shed on the night that Jesus was betrayed it says he took the bread he blessed it and then he broke it said take either my body broken for you and they partook of it and then he said the same way after supper he took the cup saying this is the, the, the cup of my new covenant the old covenant in the old testament every time every year you know, as an Israelite, you'd raise a lamb and you'd take it to the priest to have it slaughtered on the Day of Atonement and that lamb's blood would cover your sins for a year, only to do the, the same experience again and again and again. But the New Covenant says there's one person, his name was Jesus, who's the lamb that was worthy to be slain from the foundations of the earth. That Jesus is sacrificed on the cross as a sin, sinless human being. He lived a sinless life. He took our sins upon him on the cross to forgive us it's a substitutionary death so the cup we represent have in our hand represents the body or the blood which was shed for us on the cross for forgiveness of sin I'm here thankful for forgiveness of sin it's forgiven us I want to thank him for these elements I, I've often said that uh, the brokenness of the bread represents the brokenness in our lives we have a God who can identify with brokenness I'm here thankful he can identify with our weaknesses the Bible says we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize or understand. Uh, we're, we're broken humans who need God. And the world sees stuff broke. We live in a throwaway culture, but God sees something broken. He goes, I died for that. I know how to put the pieces back together. I know how to restore hope. Let's thank him right now with these elements. Lord, we thank you for what we hold in our hand. We thank you for what the bread, the bread, the bread symbolizes, your brokenness, your body, the, the, the painful experiences you walk through to bring wholeness to us. And God, we're thankful for what this cup represents, your shed blood, for the forgiveness of sin. God, we are desperately in need of a God who can forgive us. And we're thankful. We center our thoughts right now. We just say thank you, thank you, thank you for dying on the cross to forgive us, to heal us, to restore us. You came to give us life and life abundantly, which means you can take our brokenness and restore us. You can take our hurt and you can heal us. You can take our sin and you can forgive us. We thank you for that right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're going to sing this song again. As you do, or as we do, go ahead and partake of the bread and, and the cup as we, as we just uh, maybe spend a time examining your hearts right now privately as we sing this song one more time. There's power in the cross where you proved your love. You're the only sacrifice strong enough to save us. You rose in victory. Hi, friends. My name is Mark, and I'm one of the pastors here at True North Church. And I want to say thank you for joining us today for our broadcast. I hope that the worship just that was just on was a blessing to you. I hope the message speaks to your heart. Our, our prayer is that you're encouraged with this. And I want to encourage you, if you're watching and you consistently watch and you want to make sure this broadcast is online, would you consider giving toward it? Would you partner with us? We'd love for you to do that. True North Church is an irrationally generous church. We truly believe we're more blessed to give than receive. I hope you enjoy the message that's following. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Guys, having a good day so far? How many of you guys are glad spring is coming this week? Summer's going to start next week. We have a three weeks and then, no. Um, man, it's so good to have you here. Hey, we live stream our second gathering in the correctional facilities across our state and actually around, around the nation. There's places in Arkansas and Alabama that show our live stream for, in correctional facilities as well as watch, we, people watch online. Would you give it up for those watching right now online? So glad they're here. You know, even with the challenges of all the snow on Easter Sunday, there's a, a family that flew their mom in from a, from a, from a remote village. She's an elder and uh, she came and when she left, she's noticed that we moved, and one of our staff members asked her, like, what's going on? She goes, 
I've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ that someone died for my sins to forgive me, and I can't. And she was in her late 60s, early 70s, had never heard the gospel, and she gave her life to Jesus last week. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? God's so good. Um, now, with that, we're starting a new series this week called It's Complicated. Say it's complicated. And anyone know of anyone, not yourself, that have a complicated relationships? Anyone ever gotten themselves in a situation going, okay, I mean, how am I gonna get out of this? How am I gonna fix this? How am I gonna restore this? And, and how many wanna know the Bible has guidance? Say guidance. guidance. For relationship. I'm not saying advice. Okay, this next, next five, seven weeks is not like, hey, I got some advice series for you. We're gonna offer some advice. We're gonna offer you some biblical guidance. How many wanna know the Bible is the basic instructions from Christ for our lives before leaving earth, and it has guidance for our lives, not advice. Okay, you don't try God. You try asparagus. You try broccoli. You try anchovies on your pizza. You don't try God. You commit your life to God, and God has guidance through his words. How many of you believe that? I believe that with all my heart, that the Bible is an incredible book, uh, uh, and, and there's complicated relationships, but there's prescriptions. There's things if you work, it, it works. There's things if we do it right. Uh, C.S. Lewis said this about human history. He said, human history is a long, terrible story of mankind trying to find something other than God which will make them happy. Amen. Human history is the long story of mankind trying to find something other than God to make them happy. Uh, Paul says it this way in Romans, and this is where we get it complicated. In Romans, this is a theme verse for the series. Romans chapter one, verses 21 through 25, it says, they knew God. They speaking about, he's talking about people who knew God, us. Us in a different culture, but us. He's talking about people who knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became fools. Now, how many of you guys want to be fools? Raise your hand. I don't want to be wise, raise your hand. And, and so there's a dilemma here it, 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 that, that sometimes the creation can mess things up in regards to how we interact with our creator. And then it goes on and says this, as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other with their bodies. They traded the truth, say truth, about God for a lie. This series really wants to look at, and today's kind of the, the launching pad for it. It's a series on, 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 on relationships. It's a series on marriage. It's a series, we're gonna talk about adultery. We're gonna talk about pornography. We're gonna talk about finances. We're gonna talk about lots of things. And I know this. I know that some of you are like, oh, snap. This, this, I, I, I can tell you right now, no one in this series uh, uh, with four gatherings on Sunday now, I, don't, I won't preach every, uh, every gathering. I preach two on a Sunday and one on Wednesday. And so, uh, 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 so you'll have other staff preach. We write the outlines and we share them and stuff. And so it's solid. None of us are here like, oh, we're gonna write a series and call those people out. They're living in sin. It's not that. It's a series based upon relationships are complicated. I think God has a plan for our lives, that plan that makes us have hope and future and blessed, and full of joy, full of pleasure. How many of you guys believe God has that for our lives? Yeah. Living an abundant life, the Bible says that. And if we're living in a, you know, if, if we are a God who serves a victorious God, then why do we have a bunch of defeated Christians? So this series is gonna is kind of like a little bit confrontational, a little bit like uh, the, excuse me, the Bible is very confrontational, Amen. and we're a Bible church, so we don't apologize for preaching the Bible. But at some time during this series, you might go, uh, "Oh, did he know about my life? I don't know about your life, but the Holy Spirit does, and the Bible knows." 
God knew when he created mankind that there was going to be some complicated situations in marriages and singleness and relationships that God wanted to talk about. And, and you know, and, and so here's the big idea of, of this series, is in order for relationships to work, we have to let the one who designed them define them. Let me say that again. In order for relationships to work, we have to let the one who designed them, desi- des- designed us to define what those relationships look like. Now here's the challenge, is, is when we exchange the truth for how God designed us and defined relationships and we begin to believe a lie, then guess what? We're allowing the devil to define how we think about God, how we think about relationships. And I can tell you right now, we mess it up. God's book works if we work it. It doesn't work if we listen to the devil's plans. And so, so just, that's just kind of a precursor. Uh, uh, we're gonna talk uh, uh, about, uh, now here's what I know. Whenever, you can, whenever the Bible speaks to situations that can kind of convict us, sometimes the emotion we feel is called shame. And the goal is never shame. The goal is not like, oh, we're gonna preach to shame people because we want them to have their chin on their chest and feel like life never gets better. But I can tell you right now, the devil wants you to feel full of shame. God wants you to be full of conviction because if you repent when there's conviction, God brings forgiveness and he can lift your head off your, off your chin, off your chest and take the shame away. Amen. God doesn't go shame on you. God wants to go shame off you. Amen. That's the God I serve. Now, here's what I know. God, when he created Adam and Eve, let's go back to the original design of humanity. Back in, Adam, in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, God, God saw that God made man. It's the chief of his creation. He says, not good that man would be alone, so God put him to sleep and took a rib out and made a woman because God knew that man would have lots of problems without a helpmate, the Bible says. So he creates a woman, and, and uh, 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 in, that pro- in, in, that, in that creation process, in Genesis chapter two, verse 25, it says, and the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Say no shame. They felt no shame. But in Genesis chapter three, Satan comes into a picture where man and woman were naked, they felt no shame. There, they, you know, th- there was intimacy, there was all those things and, and, and there was intimacy and sex, and God created it. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and be united with his wife. God has a design for family that includes a husband and a wife, a man and, and a woman, and they'll leave each other to be united. God made a male and female in his own image and likeness. They felt no shame. The devil comes in and goes, I am going to complicate the picture here. How many want to know the devil would love to complicate every single relationship? And in Genesis chapter 3, let's go there, and I want to unpack it this morning. But in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than all of the other animals the Lord God had made. Now here's the thing. God is uncreated. The serpent is created. The opposite of God is not Satan. Satan is not the opposite of God. Satan is the opposite of another created being called an angel. He's a fallen angel, okay? He's not, God has no opposite. God is the uncreated and everything else has been created. So no, just so you know that. Uh, uh, the Lord, so, so, so he said to the woman, God, did, did God really say, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but, but, but the middle of the garden, uh, 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 sorry, I put my glasses on the middle here. You may eat from any tree in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll die. You will not certain, certainly die. The, the devil starts to mock like, you're not gonna die. Are you serious? Did God really say you can't eat from any tree? And he says, you're certainly not gonna die. The serpent said the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, not knowing that God already made them like him. He made them in his image and his likeness. They're already like God. When you sin, it doesn't make you like God. It makes you less like God. Knowing good and evil. And when, and when the woman saw that the fruit was, of the tree was good, uh, 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 good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, 
She took some and ate it. She also gave same, some to her husband. Why? Because the, the man was there too. And the man, for whatever reason, the woman took the ownership or leadership in this relationship. And where's, where's the man? God told Adam, don't eat from the tree in the garden. And so somewhere along the lines uh, uh, that they're both there, it says, who was with her? And he, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they're naked, so they sig sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. In other words, they saw each other's nakedness, and this time they felt shame. Why? Because when you look at nakedness through eyes uh, uh, of sin, it looks different than when you look at nakedness through the grace God has given you through design. Now, now, this message, I, my, again, my prayer is not that it brings up shame. My prayer is the Holy Spirit will work in each of our lives to show us how God has designed us. Now, now, now uh, uh, there's, uh, there's a joke I heard, and I want to share it because the rest of the message is a little heavier, so I'm going to have a little laughter here, okay? Um, uh, there's a pastor who was a smaller church, and when people would visit, they'd fill out a guest card, and they'd drop in the offering bucket, kind of like we'll do at the end of our gathering here. And, and he would go knock on the doors of those homes on Sunday afternoons to say, thanks for coming. And I can promise you that's not going to happen. We sometimes have 50 guest cards turned in. I'm not going to go to 50 houses. Um, there's other ways we'll connect with you. But, but, and so he knocks on the door and doesn't get an answer. So he, he, uh, he writes a scripture verse on this card that says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. And, and if anyone were here, were here my voice, they'd open the door and I will come into them and, and they, they to me. And, and we'll sup. And so he writes Revelation chapter three, verse 20. Next Sunday, he gets the card back in the offering plate, the one he'd written on, with another scripture verse that says, uh, I, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. <laughs> there we go. That's the joke. All right. They worked on Wednesday, too. No. Today, I want to look at four. I want to look at this text, and I want to look at, and really, it's the, it's the foundation message for this series, where we exchange the truth about God for a lie. And that the devil wants to lie to us. And I want to look at four lies from Genesis 4, Genesis 3, excuse me, that kind of lay the foundation for this message uh, uh, regarding sexuality, nakedness, and shame. Step number one, the devil wants to get us to question God's word. That's the first step. And they're progressive. Because if he get us to question God's word, he can get us to the next step. We'll talk about it in a moment. The next step until we live in shame. And we're hiding our nakedness and we're, and, we're cut, and we're cowering in fear. And God doesn't want us to live in fear. God want, designed us to be in intimate relationships with no shame. So the devil does not, gets us to question God's word. In Genesis 3, we, we, we see that thing. Did God really say? He's getting us to question. Remember, you know, in, in, in the Gospels, Jesus the same, this, 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 the first temptation in the Old Testament is, did God really say you're not to eat from every tree in the garden? New Testament, Jesus is water baptized. He comes up out of the water, and what does he hear? A voice from heaven says, this is my son. In him I'm well pleased. This is my son. And if you read the Bible scriptures, they immediately he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted and tormented, and he fasts for 40 days. And when the devil shows up, he says this, if you are the Son of God. 40 days earlier, this is my Son. Let me just say, friends, the devil would want you to question God's word. In other words, lie number one, step number one is question. Lie number one, God's word isn't Totally true. How many want to know God's calling us through his word to a place we've never been before? A place he has for us? How many want to know that's a good place? And I, 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 I reflect back on, is there ever been times that I've heard a message and thought, well, that's, yeah, you don't know, it's, it's not. You get, I, anyone struggle with certain things in their life? Anybody? And, and for me, you ever been hurt by someone? For me, so I, I, this is Mark. There's been times I've been hurt by people, and so I'll hear a thing on forgiveness, and I'll be thinking, yeah, but that pastor doesn't know about my situation. You know what I'm talking about? And we try to rationalize how, well, perhaps 
uh, uh, you know, I, you, you start to question, well, the word, I mean, in, in my particular situation, it's okay to stay bitter. It's okay to stay unforgive or full of unforgiveness. You ever been that place where you start to question, like, well, I don't know if it fits my situation particularly perfect. So I, I how many want to know the devil wants us to question whether his word is true? He wants us to, did God say that? And he wants us to come to a place where we, where, where, where we adapt our lives more to our preferences and we, and we want to push God's word to a side to where we, 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 we kind of wanted to adapt to our style of life rather than allow the word to change our life to adapt to it. You know what I'm talking about? In other words, there's times in our life that, that we, we kind of try to, we squeeze the word of God into our preference and how we live our life rather than let the word of God morph us and transform us to become like people of the word. And this causes a dilemma. Do I, what, what do I do? And, and the choices are simple, but they're complicated. If you pick God's path, it seems to work. If you pick your path, it gets pretty complicated. You can exchange the truth of God for a lie. Uh, uh, the word of God confronts us. In 1 Thessalonians, it says this, we thank God. God continually because when we received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as word from men, but actually as it is, the word of God which is at work in you who believe. How many wanna know God's work is working in us, those who believe? How many wanna know, how many want, how many want God's work, the word to work in you, to will and to do his good pleasure? God's work is in us. How many want to know it works if we work it? That's not just a 12-step program. God's Bible works if you work it, if you do it. Timothy Keller said a powerful statement in a book I read. It says, if, you're, if your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshiping an idolized version of yourself. Let me say it again. If your God never disagrees with you, you might be worshiping an idolized version of yourself. In other words, I've got it to where I've kind of morphed the Bible around my lifestyle, my preferences, rather than have the Bible confront us and convict us and work deeply in us. Uh, uh, step, step number two, again, it starts out with questioning. Number two, the devil scoffs, scoffs at the negative consequences of sin. He scoffs at the negative consequences of sin. You won't certainly die Come on. The devil, I've, I heard it said once, the devil always minimizes the consequences and maximizes the fun. You certainly won't die. Here's the lie. This choice won't hurt anything. I mean, come on, everyone else is doing it. Are you kidding me? To live black and white, black and white like the Bible says? We live in a 50 shades of gray world. Come on. Everyone else is doing it. They go to church too. That's the lie. But, but they, uh, uh, the, the psalmist knew it well when he wrote Proverbs. Solomon says, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. It appears, say appears. In other words, it looks like it's the right way. It appears the right path, but guess what? It, it leads to death. I, in fact, this week I was, I've been reading a proverb a day and every, it just, I haven't read the Proverbs for a while, so I went back to Proverbs and, and I was in Proverbs chapter six this week and seven and nine and all three of those Proverbs end the same exact way. It's talking about wisdom. And, you know, you know, do whatever it costs to gain wisdom. It'll cost you everything, but it's worth it. But the last verse of every one of those sentences talks about um, a man who, who pushes wisdom aside and listens to the voice of the harlot. And all three of them say this, that, that, if you, that, that sex outside the context God's design, it's death and the grave. You want wisdom? We, I'll tell you right now, young men, Men in this room, wisdom is not sex outside of the context of marriage. That's called death. And I'm riding up a hill the other day and I'm talking with my buddies. We're riding up the hill and I'm thinking like, I'm thinking like I, I read that and I thought, God, I, I don't ever wanna be a husband or a man 
who literally commits death in my home for my daughters, for my son, for my family because I don't gain wisdom which says, oh, it'll cost me everything. And if I say, submit to desires in my flesh, I can kill everything around me. That's not that joke I said earlier, is it? How much reality? These steps of sin get to a place, and we go, oh, well, it's not gonna hurt me. The devil's gonna tell me it's not gonna hurt me, but guess what? It's gonna hurt everything about me. Number three. Step number three is the devil accuses God of evil intent. For God knows, this is what he said, for God knows that when you eat from this tree, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. In other words, God, God's trying to keep you back. He's keeping his best back. He, he knows that when you do this, you'll be like him. And the devil, the devil didn't stand up and say, hey, by the way, you're already like him. And if you do this, you won't be like him anymore. How many want to know, prior to sin entering the, the garden, the word Eden means a place of pleasure And flourishing. How many of you guys want know that how many of you guys would like to live in a place of pleasure and flourishing? And prior to sin, they lived in Eden with life full of pleasure and no shame, and life was flourishing. And he goes, But if you eat this, you'll be like God. And what the reality is is a lie was like, you know, they were already like God. But here's the lie: righteousness is boring, sin is fun. I mean, if you if you eat this, you're gonna see how God's keeping something back from you. How many wanna just know God's not keeping back from you? Now, the Bible does say sin is fun for a season. Say season. But let me tell you something. How many of you like how long our winter season's been this year? How many of you guys were shoveling last Sunday going like, this is a bad joke? When you... When you, when you take God's plan outside of his parameters, it becomes like a snowstorm and, and, and when it's still 18 below on the 10th of April. God, the devil goes, ha, huh, there's this thing called fun. sin. It's oh so fun and oh so fulfilling. So, and we go, oh, that's, that's a bad joke, devil. And you're shoveling snow out of your life and you're like, how come it got like this? And how come I can't get any traction? And the devil goes, you listen. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. I love what David says in Psalm 16, verse 11. You show, speaking of God, you show me the path. Say path. There's a path to walk. Life is not just like, oh, I hope I just, things just arrive. There's a path. There's choices to make. There's steps to go. The steps of righteous people are ordered of God. There's steps. The path is of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, I don't know about you. That sounds like something I want. I want fullness of joy and I want pleasures forevermore. Anyone here say, yeah, that sounds like a good prescription right there. Pleasure, joy, anyone? That, I'm the only one with my hand raised. Thanks, my wife, good. <laughs> it's taking 24 years to get her on the same page. No, <laughs> just kidding. The devil's going, hey, did God really say that? I mean, come on. If you don't do that, you're not really gonna die. You know, God, has, he's just keeping something from you because he knows if you do it, you're gonna be like him. You're gonna have freedom and joy. And what he doesn't know is what we don't know is, and how many of us, I remember I had a young person stand in my life and he'd show up at my office one day and he says, Marcus, I, 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 I don't know what happened. I, I, I said, I said, what's going on? He said, I don't know what happened. I said, what do you mean you don't have? He said, well, my, my girlfriend's pregnant. I said, I don't know what happened. I said, well, let me help you here. <laughs> I don't know how we got there. I said, well, I can tell you how you got there. You crossed a whole lot of boundaries to get there. Right. And then I walked in, you want me to unpack? He said, I still don't know how it happened. I said, well, you unbuttoned, you unzipped. You, I don't have to go any farther, bud. He goes, no. You didn't just get there. I said, somewhere along the line, you didn't think God's word applied to you anymore. You questioned what was being held from you. You started to think, well, the consequences aren't really that big, but yeah, yeah, you do need to go sit down now with a mom and dad and tell them about the 16-year-old girl 
who you entirely changed her life. And you're not sure how you got there. I can tell you how you got there. Just like this, this <laughs> the devil twisted things. Well, come on. Did God really say? I mean, we love each other. It's okay, right? And then, well, it's not that bad. And, you know, if you, you know, and, and, and I think the third part the devil comes in, it says this. The devil uses sin to create shame. That destroys future relationships. See, here's the truth, friends. Look at me. Sin is fun for a season, but you know what happens at the end of the season? There's something called shame. Shame. And, and shame is what the devil, the devil wants us to sin. All of a sudden, they looked and it was pleasing to the eye. It did look good. And so they ate and Adam and Eve ate it. And when they ate it, what happened? Now their eyes were opened and they saw, oh, snap. Oh, no. And so they felt shame. They were completely naked. And, 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 and they covered, and, and, and the lie is, it's too late. Run and hide. Adam and Eve, it's too late. You shouldn't have listened, but go hide. And so they made some fig leaves to cover their sin, and they hid. And when God came back in the quiet of the evening, he says, where are you? Number one question in the Bible. First question asked in the Bible, where are you? It's the same question he asked us today. Where are we? Are we hiding in our shame? And, 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 and when, 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 in Jesus, when God, God says, where are you? Uh, they says, we're hiding. Why? Well, because we, we, we're, we're naked. Well, who told you you were naked? Why? I, there was shame. There was this, this gut sense on the inside. And here's what I know about the Bible. It says in Psalms 34, and who knows better about this than David, who committed adultery and came to God and asked for forgiveness, asked the Holy Spirit not to be taken. And he says this, those who look to him for help, meaning God, will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. Look at me. How many want to know? You don't have to run and hide if you found yourself living in sin and making poor choices and full of shame. You don't have to hide. There's someone named Jesus who recycles sinners. There's someone named Jesus who comes, and if we confess all our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. We don't have to hide in the shadows of our shame. And they say, oh, well, no, I've gone too far. How many want, do, you, do you realize there's some people who don't feel like they can come to church because of shame? You ever invited someone to church and had to say, oh, I can't come to church. If I walked in the church, the building would fall down. You ever heard people say that? And let me just say something about True North. Let me just tell you a little bit about who we are here. At True North Church, we accept everyone that walks through the doors of this building. Look at me. We accept them. It doesn't mean we approve of all their choices in life, but we accept them. Does it make sense? There's a woman caught in the act of adultery. Jesus accepted her, and then he says, go and sin no more. He didn't say what you did was right. What he said is, I'm, I'm the person that can forgive you, heal you, restore you. Why don't you come to me, and I will give you rest and peace and hope and forgiveness. So friends, this church accepts people. Well, Brother Mark, do you know what they've done? I don't know what they've done. If you know what they've done, maybe you shouldn't focus so much on what they've done and start believing God's gonna forgive them for what they've done. Acceptance is not approval. Now, there's three responses to this message today. Number one, we can get defensive. Defensive, and you know, God made me this way, and you know, that pastor is just preaching to make me feel guilty. I, I, I don't have time to make people feel guilty. My prayer is that everyone finds a loving God full of grace that will forgive them. And if you're here like, well, my life, and if you can hold on to your life if you want, there's a way that seems right to the man, but in the end it leads to death. I'm sorry, this Bible says that you can exchange, you can exchange the truth of God for a life you want. You can live in shame, you can live in those things, or you can come out of the shadows and go, well, I'm not gonna get defensive, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say God. Or number two, you can live in remorse. And remorse is when the devil tells you you're beyond repair, you'll never get past where you're at. And I'm here to say, I believe this series when we talk about porn and adultery, and some of the things we're talking about, we don't have to live in shame, church. We are the, we are the church that God, God, and when I say the church, not like the building, okay? The church of Jesus Christ of current day saints, God rolls the shame away. Every one of us. No matter what the shingle outside our church is, God has rolled our shame away. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes. Defensiveness, remorse, 
But the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. And number three, repentance. So some of you can get defensive, some of you can be full of remorse, like I'm just stuck, I'll never get out of here. Or some of you can, can say, God, I repent, I'm sorry. The Bible says godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. If you live in shame and worldly sorrow, there's death. But godly repentance. Repentance is, God, I am sorry. I'm turning from my ways. Repentance is the Greek word metanoia. I'm changing my mind. Meta is change. And noia is mind. I'm changing my mind. I've been living this way, but God's word exposed me to truth. And I'm changing my mind to live the truth and not the lie. That's what it means. Repentance is God, I want to change my mind. And I, I want to take a moment right now, everyone bow your heads and close your eyes. Wherever you're at, you're listening online or CBS, I want to pray over you. Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity today to repent. In fact, if you're here and you need to spend a moment to say, God, there's some, there's some truth from the passage today, from this message today that's convicted me. You don't live in condemnation. That part that says, I feel bad about myself, you take that to God right now and repent. Don't let the devil bring condemnation, which lets you stay where you're at, but rather conviction. Say, God, I'm sorry. God, I pray today as people turn to you, all of us, me included, God, we need you. Help us serve you with whatever and everything we can. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Our ushers are gonna come at this time. We need you for Lord's tithes and offerings. Church, I want to say thank you for your generosity. We're starting to hear the stories from our Easter outreaches in the villages and correctional facilities. Last week, one of the mods, they played uh, uh, at Highlands Correctional Facility, they played all, uh, in all 16 mods or units, they played the Easter video. And in one of the mods, four men came out afterwards and were water baptized in front of all their friends. Got water baptized. They gave their life to Jesus. Your giving made that possible. I want to say thank you for your generosity. We're hearing back from other correctional facilities. Um, as you know, the, the chaplains are limited how much they can go in. And so that we're here the, we'll probably hear the stories over the next several months. But I want to say thank you for your generosity. Um, uh, next Sunday, I'm going to show pictures of our, of our project on College Road. Um, uh, there, there are ceiling grids going in now. We've got the carpet ordered. Um, like 98,000 square feet of carpet. That's a lot of carpet. Woo! And uh, it's looking really good. And I was over there the other day, and, I, and you just think about the fact that on August 22nd, the day, the, the Sunday before UAF opens, we're launching a second campus, walking distance from the university. And uh, uh, people are gonna come to know Jesus on, 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 on that real estate, 3295 College Road. And, uh, and then two years from now, we'll be opening up a grand opening of a brand new building. And we'll all be able to be together in a couple services rather than five. And, uh, but your generosity helps make that happen. I want to say thank you so much for believing in what God's doing here and partnering with him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Bless the gift and the giver. Multiply the offerings to help us reach our city, our state, and the globe. In your name we pray. What a fantastic service. If you would like to respond to something in today's message or receive prayer, 